Hello and welcome to the fifth session of the Carbon Friendly Forestry Conference, Tribal Carbon Offset Projects and the Climate Commitment Act. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks to the speakers for sharing their time with us and to WEC and partners for hosting us. My name is Eliza Giddis and I'm the climate scientist at the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission. We provide natural resources management support services for the 20 treaty tribes in Western Washington. First, before we go on, some logistics. If you run into any issues or have any questions about the conference, please email the address that's pinned in the chat box to the right of your webinar screen. Keep in mind that any messages that you post to the public chat box will be visible to all attendees. If you'd like to submit any questions to the speakers, please use the Q&A tab which you'll see down along the bottom of your webinar screen. That way we can easily find your questions, which we'll be sorting through and presenting to the speakers at the end of the panel. And a reminder that this session will be recorded and shared with all the participants next week. Now let's begin. Washington's new greenhouse gas pollution cap and invest program, the Climate Commitment Act or CCA, will provide resources that will support forest conservation, reforestation, and better forest management through carbon offsets. The CCA's carbon offset program is based closely on California's program, but the CCA creates a specific category for carbon offset projects on federally recognized tribal lands. This provides tribal nations with an opportunity for a new revenue stream to support their goals and natural resources management. Our panel today will showcase tribal leadership on carbon offset projects and the experiences of tribal nations in implementation through the California program. The Department of Ecology will provide an overview of the CCA offset program, and we will end with a perspective of a Washington tribal nation exploring how new carbon offset projects could work to support tribal goals and values. Before we begin, I'd like to briefly say a few words about the unique position of tribal nations. The federally recognized treaty tribes in Washington have reserved rights and the treaties with the federal government are the supreme law of the land according to the US constitution. These rights have been upheld by the courts and tribes are resource co-managers with Washington state of their treaty protected natural resources. As place-based peoples, Tribes are at the front lines of the negative effects of climate change. At the same time, tribes have been leading the way in cutting edge research and innovative climate solutions that benefit all of us. Now, I'd like to introduce the presenters for our session this morning. Cody DeSotel is the Tribal Executive Director for the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation. Javier Kinney is the Carbon Projects Manager at the Natural Resources Division of the Yurok Tribe. Corey Hinton is the lead attorney for the Tribal Nations Practice Group at the law firm Drummond Woodsum. Jordan Waldish is a senior environmental planner and the program lead for the Climate Commitment Act Carbon Offset Program at the Washington State Department of Ecology. And Steve Hinton is a conservation scientist with the Tulalip Tribes Office of Treaty Rights and Government Affairs. Now let's begin with Cody. Thank you, Cody. Thank you, Eliza. Even went to the right screen. All right, so I'll give a brief overview just of the Cabo Reservation and then of two separate carbon projects we have. So this is just a general vicinity map. The Cabo Reservation is approximately 1.4 million acres located in North Central Washington State. It's home to the 12 tribes in Cabo's Confederacy. Uh, do I have control to switch to the next slide or do I have to have somebody else do that? Okay, thank you. So the red shows the area we have included in our carbon project. It's about 450,000 acres includes uh, typically our most productive forest sites and the, the forest habitat types that are least likely to see reversals from catastrophic fire. Um, next slide, please. So just a general 
description of the project, again, 453,026 acres. Uh, we started this process in 2014 and subsequently in 2015, we had by far the largest fire year we had in our history where we burned about 255,000 acres. So we had the project almost complete, but I had to go back and make some revisions to remove the acres that had burned in high severity and some of the moderate severity burn acres as well. Um, the project development was managed by Finite Carbon, which is a contractor that does project development. Um, they've, they've done a great job for us and we continue to work with them today. Uh, the, we have a contract with British Petroleum for the purchase of all of the credits that were issued as part of this project over five years, which, which we're at the end of now. So all of those credits have been sold and the council passed a resolution that all of the revenue from those credits was to be placed in an investment account for an extended period of time. It, that's been a particularly useful investment. Uh, we've used it to secure very low term or very low interest rate loans for capital projects and other things that help support the tribal government. And in addition, it's given us a source of revenue when we have these large catastrophic events. We do have some funding available from the Bureau of Indian Affairs for fire rehabilitation, but in many situations that covers a portion of those costs. And when you have particularly big fire years, there's a significant loss of timber value that unless you can have it salvaged within roughly the first year, it's just a net economic loss to the tribe. And timber is still a pretty important part of our tribal budget on an annual basis. Next slide, please. So this is a map that shows just large fires since 2015. So we've burned almost 700,000 acres of a 1.4 million acre reservation from 2015. Um, the two large red polygons in the, the north central and northwest part of the reservation were both 2015 fires, Tunk Block and North Star. And subsequently we've had big fires almost every year since with the darker red being the 2021 fires, where we had three large fires, all over 40,000 acres, um, primarily in lightly timbered or non-timbered land, but the one on the eastern side of the reservation did impact some of our most productive forest ground. Thankfully, because of the forest management we do, we did have a lot of low and moderate severity fire. Uh, particularly when you compare it to unmanaged land or adjacent federal land, it doesn't see as much management. So we recognize the importance of not just trying to manage greenhouse gas emissions and what the complications of climate change are bringing us, but we started to recognize this really a couple decades ago and shifted our management a bit, looking at forest resiliency and restoration and how we ensure that post-fire conditions are more aligned with what historic conditions would have been. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we also have another carbon project that we've entered in fairly recently. I think we've got some working on verification now, if I remember right. Uh, this is something that came around fairly recently. Um, it's a reforestation project through the Climate Action Reserve, and it's a forecasted mitigation units is the, the credit that is issued. It's calculated based on expected carbon sequestration of trees that we replant in those burned areas. So the credits are prorated based on the number of years ex expected to be maintained in forest. And for Cawbill, for most of our forest types, we have 120 year rotation. So the picture we have in the foreground, that ponderosa pine plantation is probably 15 or 20 years old. So that will be maintained on the landscape and continue to grow and sequester carbon for another 100 years or so. Uh, the benefit of this type of carbon project is there's no long-term monitoring, but we have stocking surveys that verify the stand is fully stocked and really determines what the carbon credit allocation will be going into the future. But once that's complete, there isn't any further monitoring. And our other improved forest management project has a 100 year time commitment with annual reports and regular re-verifications roughly every six years for us or when we have an unintentional reversal. Uh, however, this, this project is fairly small in comparison. It's only about 15,000 acres. And we're, we're trying to determine how feasible this is going forward. We've had some real struggles with, particularly with climate change, with reforestation um, on those particularly dry springs and summers, our survival rates are, are low. 
uh, because of the number of acres we've burned, we have a limited amount of greenhouse capacity. We have our own greenhouse at Caldwell that can grow about 2 million trees a year, but the demand has been so high that we've had to source that for other greenhouses around the Northwest, some as far away as Northern California. So that's been a bit of a challenge, but it's another program that potentially rewards tribes or other landowners for reforestation projects that, although the, the carbon has been lost from the site because of catastrophic fire in most situations, you have opportunities to regenerate those and recapture some of that value for the long term. And I think that covers my time. Do I have one more slide? Nope, okay. So I will pass it off to the next person. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cody. Um, Javier, let's hear from you. Good morning, uh, Eliza, and uh, thank you. For, it's an honor uh, for the Yurok tribe to uh, share our experience in regards to the carbon space. Uh, my name is Javier Kinney, a Yurok tribal citizen, as well as serve as the Yurok Carbon Projects Manager for the Natural Resources Division. Uh, the objective uh, that the Yurok tribe uh, entered into this space was uh, initially in the California Cap and Trade Program, uh, tribes were not included. Um, our objective is to purchase 1.5 million uh, acres of our ancestral territory back as well as provide a natural resources portfolio that addresses the disproportionate uh, impacts of climate change, uh, as well as our natural resources portfolio, including uh, the various divisions of forestry, fisheries, watershed restoration, our environmental program, as well as our wildlife program. And most recently, we just released uh, condors, uh, which has not occurred uh, for the last 100 years. Uh, so in accordance to our Yurok constitution, we wanted to make sure to have a climate finance uh, action plan, as well as the uh, mechanisms uh, to meet not only that reacquisition um, synergy, but also uh, to have a holistic approach uh, to our natural resources division. So in uh, discussions with the uh, state of California, uh, we've had a storied history uh, with the state, uh, but again, we're moving forward and hopefully a, a positive uh, and a recognition of the nation building actions of the Yurok tribe, uh, tribal government, as well as our business entities. So currently we have three projects uh, that consist of um, a 15,000 acre project, uh, which is referred to as uh, phase one, uh, our CKGG project, which is uh, referred to uh, in regards to about 7,000 acres, and most recently uh, utilizing uh, not only state of California funding, uh, but also conservation funding uh, is the third project, which is referred to as the Capel project. Uh, so those collective uh, carbon projects uh, equal to around 40, uh, 40,000 acres. Uh, we have purchased approximately 50,000 acres uh, within the past uh, five years, uh, again, along those uh, reacquisition strategies. Uh, the various uh, technical expertise, uh, as well as the policy uh, direction has been led uh, not only by our natural resources division, but our tribal council in regards to reaching both uh, local, state, federal, and international uh, outreach in regards to reducing emissions, but also uh, pulling levers uh, that may assist uh, not only the Yurok tribe, but other uh, tribal uh, governments within the domestic United States, but also advising the Global South uh, Indigenous brothers and sisters as well. Um, in regards to our uh, position and the benefits and challenges, uh, regarding our carbon projects is one, again, uh, each tribe uh, should look at uh, the market-based approaches, whether that is aligned uh, with their uh, cultural values, their business uh, uh, strategies, as well as natural resources uh, strategies. So those market-based approaches and entering the carbon market has been exponentially beneficial uh, for the Yurok tribe in regards to those three uh, criteria and metrics. Uh, the nation building actions that have occurred, uh, again, has been um, one that has coordinated 
those various departments uh, in regards to receiving funding, uh, but also to engage uh, with uh, philanthropic uh, foundations, conservation groups, um, as well as uh, processes within uh, the federal and the United Nations uh, governments in regards to uh, how carbon uh, markets uh, can be able to position uh, indigenous peoples and in decision-making roles rather than just consultation uh, roles as well. We appreciate the, the commitments to uh, jurisdictions in recognizing inherent rights, uh, but we want to put that uh, with action. Um, so again, we, we did uh, negotiate the, the inherent um, sovereignty rights uh, in regards to our lands, uh, but also the considerations of a limited waiver of sovereign immunity and the 100 year commitment. But in regards to the specific policy challenges as well, uh, there are uh, diverse perspectives in regards to uh, not only indigenous peoples or tribal governments entering the market based approaches, uh, but that's one thing that the Yurok tribe has asserted its sovereignty within. Um, this past uh, year, we've also engaged in uh, cultural diplomacy and climate diplomacy actions. Um, we have uh, continued to uh, move the needle in regards to not only how uh, the Yurok tribe is able to consistently uh, formulate these types of strategies and technical expertise, capacity building, uh, but we've been able to utilize these revenues, as mentioned before uh, by uh, our colleague, um, in various other uh, areas, such as uh, seed funding uh, for our other tribal entities. Uh, we purchased uh, the largest private uh, Yurok cultural co uh, collection, which uh, had, uh, again, various uh, ceremonial and cultural lifeways uh, items. Uh, but most importantly, we're investing back into our natural resources management and uh, capacity building. Uh, we have been engaged uh, also with the governor's task force uh, in regards to coordinating and strategizing uh, with uh, the various uh, subnational uh, governments, uh, both in the United States, which includes uh, the West uh, Coast Bloc. Um, our chairman is, uh, again, uh, today uh, signing agreements uh, to remove four dams, uh, which has been a 25 uh, year process as well. And that uh, land, water, forestry uh, synergy is, is the type of uh, action oriented and direct action that the Iraq tribe uh, looks forward in including our carbon projects and our carbon portfolio as just one small tool of that portfolio. Um, we've also been engaged uh, at the COP23 uh, in Bonn, Germany, COP27 in Scotland, um, in Glasgow, Scotland, and most recently uh, in Sharm el Sheikh, uh, Egypt. Uh, we want to make sure and share uh, that story that the Yurok tribe has been able to uh, provide as one of the first uh, projects within the cap and trade program. Uh, we also believe in the administrative and regulatory authorities. Um, as we look at the next generation of carbon markets, uh, again, we want to reach out to our, our tribal uh, brothers and sisters uh, as these uh, not only compliance markets uh, begin to develop, uh, but also the various uh, voluntary markets as well. And so we've been able to uh, visit um, indigenous communities in, in Brazil, uh, as well as uh, participate in the Forest Forum in Oslo, Norway. Uh, because we believe that uh, there's approximately 1 billion uh, available of climate financing um, at the international level. Uh, we've uh, hosted summits on the Yurok Reservation uh, prior to uh, the Climate Action Summit in San Francisco, which brought those individuals and, and technical experts to the Yurok Reservation and Assessor Territory to explore ways of cooperation, uh, baseline studies, uh, that we can share and uh, engage in uh, those uh, processes as well. Uh, of that 100 billion, we're, we're looking at hopefully securing a minimum of 1 billion of that, again, throughout our natural resources um, division, but also throughout the various considerations um, of uh, insurance um, capabilities, uh, backing assets of where tribes are, again, also in spaces that aren't necessarily uh, just limited uh, to non 
uh, tribal governments or non-business entities. So we're exploring those areas. Uh, our carbon projects have uh, provided that opportunity to engage in those discussions and negotiations. Uh, but again, the cultural diplomacy and the cultural principles and business approaches has also provided the opportunity for us to engage in academic partnerships, um, as well as creating uh, the next generation of technology that's going to be likely utilized uh, within this space. Uh, one particular partnership includes uh, working with the Space Enabled Research Lab out of MIT. Uh, we're looking at how space enabled imagery uh, coupled uh, with LIDAR uh, can actually provide and inform not only the Yurok tribe, but other uh, decision makers as, as well as mitigating and planning and projecting uh, the various climate types of uh, situations, disasters, um, and mitigating those uh, for the investment on the front end rather than the back end. Um, a second uh, opportunity and um, corporation we just created is uh, Condor Aviation. As I mentioned uh, before, we had just released some uh, condors within our wildlife but we're recognizing that the technology sphere and space uh, will require programmers uh, as well as um, modelers uh, within this space. So we're not only paying for uh, consultants, but we also can help bring those services in-house. Uh, so we are now the provider of the most advanced technology in the LIDAR space on the West Coast uh, by, by a tribe. It's housed within our a fisheries program, again, documenting not only the river dam removal, but also we'll be utilizing our uh, technology uh, and creating the prototype with MIT of how these might be able to inform uh, these uh, climate and natural resources portfolios decisions. Um, but again, I, I believe I'm uh, coming up on my time, uh, but I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. And I would just like to close that again, the, the coordination and cooperation and partnership uh, between uh, California tribes, uh, which are two, the Round Valley tribe and the Yurok tribe, as well as uh, Washington tribes, um, as well as the other uh, engagement of tribes uh, will help develop not only the next generation of uh, carbon sequestration, but the technology uh, that should be used uh, along with it. So uh, thank you for my, uh, the time and I appreciate the opportunity to participate on the panel. Thank you so much. Um, next, we will hear from Corey Hinton. Hello, my name is Corey Hinton. I'm an attorney out of uh, Drummond Woods. I'm a law firm in Portland, Maine. I represent tribal nations um, from east to west around the United States. Um, with a particular focus on, on carbon sequestration offset projects. I began working in carbon. Uh, I graduated law school in 2011. I was working in carbon around 2013. Um, the first project that I was involved with was a project that, that my own tribe, the Passamaquoddy tribe, developed in the um, California compliance market. That project was, was registered um, in about 2017, it was approved by the tribe in about 2014, after uh, about 18 months of development, just to get the tribe to be comfortable advancing the policies necessary, necessary to support the project itself. Um, the project was developed with, with finite carbon, um, and the project involved enrollment of approximately 98,000 acres in, in ca the California program. The Passamaquoddy tribe, for those that don't know, um, is a tribe located in a, the eastern United States in Maine, as far east as you can go in the United States. We literally have uh, my, my community, it, we call it Zabayak, the place at the edge of the water, um, is located on the salt water. We have lands east to west across the state of Maine, um, going from literally the salt water to the, the western edges of the state, which sit on the, the Canadian border next to Quebec. But um, but our history in Maine was such that we lost all of our lands, essentially, and the tribes reacquired them over time um, under a, a very restrictive federal law that generally subjects the tribe to state jurisdiction in many, many, many ways. So there's no gaming in Maine. There's no opportunity to develop businesses, you know, commercial, industrial enterprises, whatever they may be, in the same way that tribes can elsewhere. And so reacquiring natural resources has been, and, and figuring out how to use those to 
reconstitute the tribe's economy has been the, the tribe's MO, economically speaking. Um, so our lands that are included in this 98,000 project are spread out. They are not in one place. They are not in contiguous, contiguous parcels. Um, you, you could drive probably two hours um, across a combination of tribal and non-tribal lands to go from the eastern to the western edge of, of this carbon project. Um, but still, from little parcels to the entire 98,000 acres, this project has generated um, probably about upwards of 4 million offsets since 2017, which has generated tens of millions of dollars in revenue. Um, the scale of this is, is probably not you know, nearly what you know, a much larger project like, like Colville has established, but, um, but this level of revenue for a tribe of about 3,700 citizens in very, very rural, um, pretty you know, economically distressed Maine has had significant economic benefits. Um, when the pandemic started, before there was a CARES Act, before anyone knew what was gonna happen, it was tribes emergency funds that um, stocked the food pantries and bought emergency food and medical supplies for the Passamaquoddy communities of which there are multiple um, as everything was shutting down. It was carbon credit revenue that, that was the, the tribe's first lifeline before you know, the CARES Act was passed. Um, the opioid epidemic has crushed us in down East Maine. And it was our carbon project that was seed funding to start um, medical assisted treatments um, and various forms of, um, of creating uh, a, a, an inpatient and outpatient treatment network for people suffering from substance abuse issues. Seed funding came from the carbon project. It's yielded um, investments that the tribe has been able to make in our other natural resource based um, businesses. We own one of the largest um, wild blueberry farms in the world. Um, and uh, that company was under severe distress um, because we were essentially defrauded by a partner, unfortunately. And if it wasn't for the tribe's carbon project and the ability for the tribe to provide a, a very competitive, essentially a loan, a, a line of credit to, to its company, um, that company may have gone under. under. Um, and that's a Section 17 company. So, you know, for those out there from Indian country, you know what it means when you've got one of these companies, you know, facing into the abyss. Our carbon project provided revenue to stabilize that business, which is now thriving again. Um, I could go on and on about the specific economic benefits that the project has had for Passamaquoddy, but it's been, it's been significant. And one of the ways that we've been able to do that is the, the planning for the project, the development of the project itself involved very careful work with um, representatives of the tribal businesses, um, representatives of the different tribal communities to understand where the businesses, where the communities may be utilizing lands, may be developing, trying to really engage in, you know, long-term widespread community land planning. Um, and so our carbon project was the, the lands over many parcels were sort of carved up in a way that would maximize the ability to generate carbon, that would protect our very, very important forest economy. We've been working in the woods as long as anybody here. Um, and that is a part of our culture and our economy that has to continue. So our carbon project protects the ability of people to be in the woods, our loggers, our forest managers, protects our, our maple syrup operation, which produces the best maple syrup in the world, passwithquadimaple.com. Um, and it was a really a beautiful exercise in land use planning, which, you know, if it wasn't for the carbon project, I'm not sure that that type of planning would have ever happened. So um, it's been remarkable. And, and the outcomes for all of this has led the tribe to view its natural resource planning as a much more dynamic thing. Um, accounting for carbon, accounting for the economic benefits that carbon sequestration has in the community has resulted in a philosophical shift, a sort of recalibration around how we view our forest resources. Um, I love to hear about the 120 year harvest rotation that, that Colville has um, and, and how that balances with, with their carbon um, projects. And I think the experience for Passamaquoddy has been similar. We found carbon has worked very, very um, complement in a very complementary way with, with our forest management um, plans that were already in place. But uh, I just, you know, I've worked with Passamaquoddy tribe and, and tribes elsewhere in the United States um, to, to, to start carbon offset projects. I've worked with non-tribal landowners as well. Um, and so I wanted to just put out a, a few 
keys that I've seen um, that I think are important to project development considerations and, and legal considerations. Um, the number one most important thing is community education. And I found that the, the notion of, of carbon offsets um, in, in some parts of the world, it's a little bit of a, you know, a, a, a dirty word, carbon credit, you know, are you just promoting pollution by somebody else? There are a lot of um, challenging and, and sometimes very false narratives out there um, that are important to confront because, you know, here we're talking about in Washington's market, in California's market, you know, a commitment of multiple generations. And we want the community to understand that and everyone to be comfortable with, with what that entails. Under, understanding that there is an economic upside that is worth capturing for your community is really important. Accurate feasibility studies are key. I've seen feasibility studies be so far out of whack, it's not even silly. So working with a project developer that you can trust, who's got the technical capacity to give your decision makers um, the information that you need to make the right decisions is really, really important. Um, and, and that all goes along with being able to plan for the next generation. The more you know, the more data you have as you're planning this project or considering it, the more you'll be able to share with your community what the multi-generational benefits of a carbon offset project can be. At Passamaquoddy, we've seen it. Um, I love that, that the Washington state model is taking a different approach to waivers of sovereign immunity. The California market, of course, requires a waiver of immunity. And I saw tribal nations walk away from the table because of that. There are, is a voluntary program out there that, that doesn't require a waiver of immunity. And that's become more attractive because of how rigid California has been in this regard. So I love Washington state's more dynamic approach um, and I just think it's important to keep in mind that, that waivers of immunity don't always need to be the way business is done. Oftentimes it has to be that way, but as Washington State is showing, there are other tools in our toolbox to provide accountability and transparency in carbon project management. Um, and so I would just encourage those out there um, who are looking at not just what, what Washington requires, but what a counterparty, a commercial counterparty will require, you know, do you need a waiver of immunity? You know, what are the legal considerations? There are many. Um, and, and having a forward thinking approach to just mapping those out, understanding them before you go too much further is really, really important. Um, so I'm glad that I've been able to share this little bit of information with, with everybody here today. I'm extremely grateful um, for the opportunity to be here. I wanna thank my friends from around Indian country, Javier in particular for, for bringing me along here. Um, I'm grateful, good she well one. Thank you so much. That was excellent. Um, now we would like to hear from Jordan Waldish from the Department of Ecology. Thank you. Let me see if I can grab my slides here. Perfect. All right. Thank you. My name is Jordan Wildish. I lead the carbon offset component of Washington State's Climate Commitment Act program, or the CCA. Um, Today, I'll be speaking about carbon offsets in the CCA and specifically the role of tribal carbon projects in the offset program. So I wanted to start just briefly outlining what the CCA is because it's, it's such a brand new program for our state uh, and then share a bit about the role of offsets and tribal carbon projects specifically in the program. And then lastly, mention Ecology's new tribal grant program. So the CCA was signed into law in 2021 um, and the program will launch, meaning that the, this cap on emissions will begin in effect um, on January 1 of, of this coming year, 2023. Uh, and the program will cover about 75% of the statewide, of statewide emissions. Um, and that's power facilities, natural gas suppliers, fuel suppliers are being the largest covered sectors. Um, and starting from our baseline emissions in the 2019-2015 period, uh, the program requires that emissions must decline uh, in order to meet a 2050 goal of being 95% below 1990 levels. So lots of numbers there, but bringing Washington State to near near net zero by 2050. Um, that's the the cap in the sort of the cap and invest program, a statewide cap on emissions. And the way this works is that covered entities have to obtain a, a compliance instrument uh, to cover their emissions. So there are two types of compliance instruments. There are emissions allowances, which are uh, sold by ecology at quarterly auctions. 
And then there are ecology offsite credits, which can be used to fulfill a portion of an entity's compliance obligation. So for, for offsets to be to be used uh, for a compliance, uh, it's only a small, an entity can only, only fulfill a small portion of their compliance obligation using offsets. Uh, that's 8% in the first compliance period, which is the first four years, and then 6% thereafter. And then of that 8%, 3% uh, of those offsets must be sourced from uh, projects on fairly recognized tribal lands. Um, offsets have a, a high bar to qualify in the program. Um, they must result in real, quantifiable, verifiable, and permanent emissions reductions or removals. Uh, they need to reduce or avoid emissions that are not covered by the Cap and Invest program or other programs. They also need to result in emissions that are additional to what would be normally or, normally or naturally occurring. Um, and then they need to provide direct environmental benefits to the state. Um, they also need to be developed in line with uh, an eco uh, ecology adopted protocol, which I'll mention next. So ecology has adopted four offset protocols. Um, for folks who are familiar with California's cap and trade program, uh, we've adopted four protocols that have been developed and in use in that program for several years. Um, so I'll, I'll dig in the most of the, the US forest protocol today. Um, but there's these four are the, the US forest protocol, the urban forest protocol, livestock, and then the ozone depleting substances protocol. So the, the US forest protocol, the vast majority of offsets in California's program have been forestry offsets, US forest protocol offsets. And most of those credits have been in the improved forest management project type. Um, but offsets can also be generated from avoided conversion projects, uh, which in includes preventing uh, the, the conversion of forest land to non-forest uses. Um, and then from reforestation projects as well, which generates offsets by planting trees typically. So I won't delve kind of too deep in, into the process of how an offset project is created in ecology's market in the interest of time, but in short, it's a multi-step process. So the first step is always for the landowner to assess whether or not an offset project is feasible uh, for, for their land or their, their forest type or intended practices. Um, Often landowners will work within a project development team that has experience in that particular kind of a forest project. Um, the developer will then list the project with ecology, at which point the landowner completes the project activity, whether that's planting trees or establishing a management plan. Um, and then the developer will contract with a third party verifier um, to verify the emissions reductions or removals. Um, and then if, if all that checks out, Ecology will then issue credits and only at, at that point can the credits be used by an entity for, for their compliance obligations. So it's, it's, a, it's a long process and it's by necessity to ensure that these credits are real and verifiable and have high integrity. Uh, I'll mention just a few kind of differences between Washington and California's markets. So uh, a major difference, uh, I'd say uh, across the board, Washington's market closely mirrors California's, especially uh, on the protocol side and also on the administrative pieces. The process of listing a project is, is very similar, for example. Um, there are a couple of key differences, uh, more here than I'll mention, but uh, just, just a few to highlight. So uh, Washington's proposed program has a specific carve out, as I mentioned, for, for offsets on tribal lands. And the program also requires that all projects provide direct environmental benefits or DEBs to the state. And before I wrap up here, I wanted to uh, sort of talk about what our, our next steps are going forward. So the program will, will launch with, with the four offset protocols I mentioned above, but we'll begin work in the, in the next year to consider new protocols and revisions to these existing protocols. Um, we see California's protocols that we've adopted as a starting point for the program, but we know that new and revised protocols can allow for more project types to be to be uh, used in the program, more landowners to access these funds, um, and allow more offsets to be generated. So right now we're kind of sprinting um, to prepare for the launch of the CCA program next month, um, but we expect to begin the process of considering new and revised protocols in the coming year. And I wanted to close up by mentioning this, this grant program, which Ecology just launched in the past year. Um, this is the Tribal Carbon Offset Assistance Grant Program. 
Uh, so the, the program opened for applications in, in July of this year and closed in, in September. Um, but we expect it will reopen again in the coming year for the coming biennium. Um, so the, the program in this past year made available $5 million in funding to support tribes in the process of designing or assessing the feasibility of, of carbon offset projects. Um, because the, the offset project process is so time intensive, as I mentioned previously, there's so many steps involved, we see this grant program as an important tool to help tribes be able to access and consider the feasibility of offset projects on their lands. So I will wrap up there. Thanks very much for your time. Um, and please feel free to reach out if any questions I can't answer in the Q&A today. Thanks. Thank you, Jordan. And next we will hear from Steve Hinton from Tulalip Tribes. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much uh, to the folks at Washington Environmental Council and uh, these distinguished panel panelists that I've had the pleasure of uh, joining here today. Uh, I am with Tulalip Tribes. I am uh, charged with helping to implement our climate adaptation strategy. And today I want to talk about that effort that we've embarked, embarked upon and how offset protocols play a role in that. Uh, so first I want to start talking about how uh, we, we view uh, climate adaptation and our approach to it in general. Uh, and then uh, could wrap up talking about how the offset protocols play a role. Um, the, uh, our approach is, um, excuse me, first of all, just uh, it's kind of enshrined in the, the recognition that there is a huge role that Northwest forests play on the global stage. We have a wonderful opportunity, wonderful opportunities to play, um, make a significant difference in how the, the world is uh, adjusting to climate change. And what is, we want to ask ourselves, what can our region uh, contribute? Obviously with the temperate forests we have, we have uh, ample opportunity to help with sequestration. But the question before us is how do we how do we improve on that? How do we do uh, how do we approach management differently so that we are able to sequester more carbon and be more effective in this in this race against uh, our uh, our planet's instability? Um, how do we reach our potential given these constraints? Do we uh, and how do we incorporate our community's future? and uh, secure our, the Tulalip lifeways in the process. Um, what we're really intrigued by is whether or not carbon can really be talked about as a common language. And how does that interplay start to uh, manifest itself in, in local markets and regional markets with the um, emerging carbon market here, uh, thanks to the Climate Commitment Act? And most importantly, can we honor our reciprocal relationships with the earth as we move forward um, in trying to implement these projects? Just a quick word about uh, reciprocity and reciprocal relationships. We believe it starts with understanding. And I like to always think that, you know, Western science is playing catch up in a big way uh, in trying to uh, put into context how ecological processes work. And we're really, I think over the years getting better, but it's, uh, we've got a long ways to go. And it's, it's almost like in some, some ways, like we're kindergartners uh, in our learning life lessons, at least from the standpoint of, of science and how populations and ecological processes work together. Of course, one way that we try to describe that is through ecosystem services. And of course, carbon plays a, a central role. It's one of those ecosystem services that's uh, out there. And can we view that carbon cycle as, as kind of a, one of the core ecological and reciprocal processes? Can we talk about it in that way? Um, and of course, climate change, we believe firmly, uh, is a reflection of our reciprocal relationships being out of balance. So our strategy is really to, 
to try to find ways in which uh, we can implement policies where sources support sinks. And we, we need to do this not on just a level where we're working within the community of Tulalip itself, but in the broader community, in the broader region, the context in which we all live. Um, so none of this can be done alone. We recognize that Tulalip plays a significant role and what we can do to help and support our community is critical, but it doesn't happen without the partnerships necessary to implement policies on a larger basis. The forests and how we manage those forests are key to that. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we've got an opportunity here to manage these forests in a different way, in a way that sequesters carbon more effectively and helps all of us, not just the Tulalip community, but the broader region, the Pacific Northwest, the United States, North America, and the globe. But in order to realize those, uh, that effective change, we believe there has to be a, a regional framework for cooperation. And we need to realize in that framework, the ability to, to recognize community benefits, uh, reciprocity at the uh, local level. And so that those actions that we take to uh, sources uh, of carbon need to support the sinks within those communities, within that region in which they occur. So we are grateful that the state has recognized that and has really um, you know, set the framework so that the direct benefits of offset projects need to go to benefit Washington State. And more specifically, we're interested in, in implementing a, a watershed uh, strategy, uh, basin by basin, watershed by watershed, that really kind of recognizes that community level. So uh, what are the management strategies we can incentivize within the individual watersheds in which we're working? Excuse me, it's going the wrong way here. So real quick, it all comes down to accounting for carbon and not just around the offset projects itself. We believe that we should try to implement strategies where we're uh, understanding what our base carbon footprint is for any kind of project out there, but uh, how the watershed is really storing carbon to begin with. So for us, we're thinking about this two, two sides of the ledger within the Snohomish Basin uh, here in Washington State. Uh, we're trying to understand what the standing carbon stock looks like, what growth is there, what management uh, it, actions are taking place that increase growth, how is reforestation or for afforestation occurring, and some of the uh, debits against that ledger, uh, which of course is harvest and, and those sort of things, but that also goes to sequester carbon in our uh, in our local built environment. So understanding how all those work together as well. So in order to, to start building the framework, we're trying to apply some modeling tools that give us a sense of the uh, total carbon stores within uh, the Snohomish Basin and down to the individual huck levels within the basin. And one of the tools that we've been working with is uh, a program that's been developed by the EPA uh, called VELMA. Uh, visualizing ecosystem land management assessments. It's been a very useful tool. It's allowing us to, to uh, essentially build out our model to understand how we may be able to retain water uh, further into the summer, for example, but also what those standing carbon uh, stocks might be. So it gives us a tool by which we can start understanding how individual projects might move the needle within that watershed where they're being proposed and we can put it in that watershed context. Now, we're also uh, looking at the uh, Forest Service FIA uh, biomass uh, tool as well. But the point being that if we're able to put each watershed in the context of what its, its uh, current uh, you know, kind of standing stock looks like, we can think about strategies in which alternative forest managements and, or, management strategies in a watershed context can reshape the landscape and really help kind of build out sequestration 
uh, and really maximize some of our opportunities. So <clears throat> as a part of, once we have these baseline tools, we're trying to scope the offset markets, voluntary and regulatory, for those for those markets to actually incentivize some of the management approaches that we've been um, sampling. And those aren't just longer rotation, but they could be patch dynamic type harvest, uh, thinning strategies, a variety of different strategies um, put across not just individual uh, forest units, but across uh, watersheds and the landscape in general. We're also uh, more importantly, uh, in the context of the offset conversation, we are uh, we're fortunate enough to receive some funds from the uh, Department of Ecology and the state to work on looking at the aggregation protocols that are out there, uh, the aggregation conversation, because we believe that uh, being kind of a, a generally sm smaller land-based tribe, the, a lot of Western Washington tribes are very small in their, their land bases as well. We need to think about aggregation protocols as they may be able to roll up and put uh, projects on the ground that, again, in the context of a watershed, move the needle within that watershed. I'm trying to build out a context in which aggregation can actually um, realize net benefits locally and for our communities in these individual watersheds. So we hope to uh, explore the feasibility of, of aggregation approaches and certainly look for ways in which we can not only engage smaller, uh, have smaller tribe land bases a part of the solution, but also how smaller landowners and each individual within these watersheds and community can play a role in helping to build out our sequestration potential. And so in the process of doing that, hopefully we can develop watershed management plans that provide that framework for incentivization and not just having incentivization coming from the offset markets, but through a variety of other sources. It could be taxing bases, it could be um, grants, um, individual uh, kind of private donations. There's a variety of ways to start thinking about it if we've got this framework, which helps uh, stitch our region and communities together. We're also, uh, of course, as I mentioned, working with collaborators and stakeholders to adopt policies that expand these this carbon sequestration strategy and uh, looking for ways in which we can all pull together uh, with a common language. And so, and as I'm sure this audience is well aware, there's lots of uh, policies for expanding the carbon sink. These are a few of them that uh, might be out there. But a key, uh, of course, to all of them is, is you know, kind of the market forces that drive incentivization. We want to try to find ways in which that framework can help drive that, that market incentivization and how offsets play a role in that, both the regulatory and voluntary, voluntary markets. Um, so thank you very much for your time. That's what I uh, have for us today. Um, and I'll kick it back to Liza. Thanks. Thank you so much, Steve. And thank you to all of the panelists. That was so interesting and thought provoking. I have so many thoughts in my head um, and questions to ask, um, but we'll go for questions from the audience first. But, um, you know, just something that, a couple of things that I'm thinking about. Um, one is the comment about uh, the difference between decision-making roles versus consultation. I thought that was very intriguing. And uh, I really loved um, how each of the speakers um, in different ways um, was, was able to bring this question of carbon storage down to the specifics of their community, but also um, the broader interests of the ecosystem level and even the global level. So that was really interesting. And uh, I'm also wondering how um, efforts of carbon storage in forests can be integrated with forest management for resilience. For example, the talk yesterday about hydrological resilience and how that could be integrated into these projects. So many questions in my head, but let's start out with the questions from the audience. So thank you to all of you who've asked questions. Um, the first question is about the waiver of sovereign immunity 
that is required for a carbon credit sale in the compliance market. Um, do any of the tribes want to answer, any of the speakers here um, want to talk about how they are approaching this? Um, we already did hear a little bit about it, about looking for alternatives, and that is something that was also um, discussed among the tribes in Washington too, about um, you know seeking um, a framework where each tribe with a project can um, determine uh, on their own how to how to approach this. So, um, Corey Hinton, please. Thank you. Classic lawyer here wanting to answer the question about uh, legal contract provisions. Um, but this is a really, really important issue <clears throat> because immunity from suit is an inherent attribute of any sovereign. And giving up that immunity for a tribal nation, it's a really serious consideration. I've seen tribes land on, on all sides of this as it relates to carbon projects in particular. Um, as someone who works in spaces outside of carbon, I'll say, depending on the type of business you're engaging in out there, um, from within any country going outside, waivers of immunity are sometimes unavoidable. Um, depending on you know how big the institution is, the the company you're dealing with, how much juice they have, um, you know that determines how much leverage you have to resist that request for a waiver. Um, but in the carbon space. We're not in California, which requires it as a condition to entering the program. Washington state has purposefully taken an alternate approach to ensuring that a, a landowner um, is accountable to the program and is therefore accountable to the lands and to the, to the public as a whole, given the purpose of this, this program. And so for me, if, if I was approaching a, a project in, in Washington state under this new opportunity, um, waivers of immunity shouldn't be entering the conversation from my perspective. Um, I've seen commercial transactions involving multi-year contracts, 40-year contracts involving sales of credits over more than a decade be done without waivers of sovereign immunity. Um, I've done that for my clients. So I know that it's possible to get a carbon deal done, a forward carbon contract without a waiver of sovereign immunity. If there are companies out there that are insisting on it, I know that there are many out there. I've done business with them and my clients have given them waivers, but don't feel like you have no choice. There are gonna be options out there. Um, what exactly they are, it's gonna depend on, you know, which developers decide to develop projects within the state of Calif uh, within the state of Washington, but there are developers out there who will not always make you waive your sovereign immunity. And some of those developers will help you sell your credits. And those developers, if they can set up the sort of chain of commerce the right way, they can do it in a way that you don't have to waive your sovereign immunity. I've seen it done. Um, and it's something that I think is, it's really worth fighting for because as I said, immunity, it's, it's an inherent right that, that shouldn't be taken lightly. Um, but every tribe views, you know, how to deal with that aspect of the business transaction differently. And that's something that of course we have to respect for, for every single tribal nation. And I would just add to that that where they are required, you can you can limit them to the scope of that waiver. So for the purposes of our carbon project, it was very specific to the provisions of the protocol and what recourse California had were we to violate those provisions. So it wasn't just a waiver of all tribal sovereign immunity, just specifically for the purposes of staying in compliance with the agreement. For the Yurok tribe, again, we always like to consider the various aspects of making sure that is a, like Cody just mentioned, very limited. But we also like the holistic um, space that this conversation has gone in as well. When you're the first tribe in, right, a lot of times you got to you gotta make sure and see what's the best for your community, for your portfolio. Uh, for us, uh, we are progressive in, in moving that in that direction. So whenever we uh, have the opportunity to not require a, a limited waiver, uh, we appreciate that. Great, thank you. Excellent answers. Um, um, just as a follow-up, um, do and then maybe this would be for Jordan, do you want to talk about Washington's alternative to the waiver of sovereign immunity? 
and um, how that differs and maybe how it might not differ. Yeah, certainly. So unlike California's program that states a limited waiver is required for, for all tribes uh, doing offset projects, Washington's program takes a different approach where uh, instead of a, that kind of blanket requirement, um, the terms are established through government to government consultation. So we would expect that rather than requiring a limited waiver, uh, tribes will consult with ecology in determining what the right approach is. Um, so uh, we, we wanted to ensure that the Washington's program doesn't have California's kind of blanket blanket requirement there across the board. Great, thank you. Any other thoughts about that? We can move on. Um, the next couple of questions are kind of related to each other. Um, and they are, so the carbon credit program, um, when it takes place on smaller size forest tracts, you know, as compared to like the Colville example, um, how does that provide effective funding support? Um, are the full sites designated to carbon credit programs or just portions of the property? Um, I think um, it's possible that Corey kind of touched upon this a little bit. And then um, a related question is about sort of the, the relative value of the sale of carbon credits versus the value of other forestry projects like extractive forestry projects like um, logging. Um, so if anybody wants to share their thoughts on that. Well, just as a smaller landowner, I guess, in, in comparison, we're in the middle. I guess you, you have your smaller cats, then you have us, then you, again, you have sort of your large land owners and uh, our, our brothers and sisters up in Alaska. We, we appreciate that space. I, I mean, that I think that's the spectrum that's reflective. We are also in a very diverse uh, ecosystem ourselves as well. And so what we're doing is, again, strategizing that. Uh, no, we're not putting all of our force in carbon by any means. Uh, but as, uh, again, a recent mill owner, um, we just purchased a, a golf course, uh, again, as well as an organic farm. And so if you're looking at that diversified portfolio, we're looking at what those economic benefits are, uh, again, the cost, but also purchasing supply chains. We, we, uh, we believe in the inherent regulatory authority as a market participant as well um, in many sort of instances that's, that's in gaming, you can see other industries, but you really have to look forward. And again, what is it that you want to accomplish uh, by your natural resources portfolio, but what are going to be those industries? Uh, we fully support going from an extractive economy to a regenerative economy. And as a mill owner, uh, again, as a golf course owner, as now a, 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 a technology LIDAR company owner, we're looking at where the trends are within these industries. So in particular, our land ownership is just one part of that portfolio. Uh, but while I uh, am on that sort of aspect, one of the uh, advices that we would provide and that we have seen in California is if your tribe is particularly interested or engaging in this market, that you have that working relationship with Jordan and his team. What California has done, again, not only from the attorneys to the technicians to the analysts, instead of getting sort of a public viewable file for you to react to, we would advise you provide the Word document to all your tribal landowners, not just as stakeholders, but as decision makers. So they're helping you influence and develop those policies, regulatory actions across the board. So that, that's what we're putting in, in, into action here in California. And again, it wasn't always that way, but as you move sort of and develop these areas, I believe about a third of California's um, cap and trade program are from tribal lands. So as we see the states benefiting from these types of mechanisms and finance encouragements, they also got to make sure and support and provide that decision making uh, abilities for not only uh, tribal governance, but again, uh, as they talk uh, an external interface with, again, federal or international parties that, that tribes are at the forefront. And, and I can speak to the economies of scale of the of a project the size of Colville. So 
for California's protocols, the inventory and verification processes are the same regardless of the size of the project. So um, if you've got a small project and tribes that have called me, I've kind of cautioned them that this, this may not may be a net money-making venture if you have a small project and the inventory and verification fees are going to eat up all the revenues that the project can potentially produce. So I, I think that's something Washington State should consider. When you look at smaller projects, do they have to be scrutinized to the same extent, recognizing that there's considerably less carbon and considerably less risk to the state accomplishing its goals? If it's something the size of Colville, then absolutely, there should be a very stringent protocol in place, and we're happy to follow that. And we set aside the revenue from those projects to make sure that we always have funding available to follow those protocols. But again, I think there's flexibility available as we develop that in Washington that, that should be considered. And if you want me to answer the, the timber sale one, I could answer that as well. I typed one in the in the chat, but um, when you look at carbon compared to just net timber sale revenues, it probably isn't gonna be comparable. I gave a quick example from Colville, just looking at what our last reporting period was for how much volume we harvested versus what a comparable tonnage would have been for carbon. So it's about one quarter of the value, but, um, Again, because of our forest management plan, because of our long rotations, because we still have a necessary component of forest management where we're changing species composition, reducing stocking to create some resilience, particularly from fire in, in Colville, then you, you can have both of those. So I think a lot of the misconception is if you have a carbon project, you're done harvesting for the duration of the project, but that's just not true. And if you're doing a good job with forest management, and a disturbance prone ecosystem, you absolutely should be doing something because we've seen examples across the West where a lack of management has led to large catastrophic events that are uncharacteristic to what we've seen historically. I'd um, piggyback off of what Cody said there. I think the, the sort of key is it's, it's management and, and planning. Um, and, you know, the economy of scale, I think to a large extent, it depends on, you know, what's been going on on these lands. I mean, long, big trees, older trees storing more carbon, a smaller tract with a higher concentration of carbon is going to provide greater economic benefits. In the East Coast, we don't have old growth. So in order to capture the economic upside that, you know, a community of our profile needed, we needed to have a little bit of a wider land base. And it, so it's really going to depend on, you know, what's under your management. But at the end of the day, because we're talking about carbon sequestration in a manner that's that's adding to the fight against climate change. The most important thing is additionality. You know, we're trying to find and figure out, you know, how our natural resource management plans are gonna, you know, be able to include a carbon offset project. We always have to be diligent about ensuring that, you know, we're protecting trees and we are doing things that are really adding to the equation, right? This has to be a value add. And it was um, a little bit of a, a puzzle to sort of figure out you know, what's already included in our forest management plan, what are future development plans, and how can we create multiple revenue streams, including carbon, including other natural resource revenue streams, in a way that really is providing additionality. Um, so this isn't necessarily just about protecting trees that will never, ever, ever be cut anyways. It's about sort of taking a step back and really planning out and quite frankly, a lot of this could be about not what we have now, but what could we have in the future and using carbon as a way to um, finance acquisition and, and leverage resources and build our land base. But um, the focus should always be on additionality. And, um, and I think that all the projects here have shown that additionality um, is possible at a smaller scale or a bigger scale. It depends on what your community's long term economic needs are, I think, at the end of the day. If, if I might jump in as well, I guess uh, without having the experience of putting a, an offset project on the ground, conceptually where we are headed is with aggregation protocols, perhaps giving us the ability to realize economy of scale uh, collectively, if we are able to put it in a framework of some sort that uh, allows us to manage the, the landscape on you know across a watershed. So the watershed management plan is there Perhaps we can find some relief to the upfront expenses of putting a project on the ground for these smaller, smaller opportunities, smaller land bases, small land uh, holders, and smaller tribes. If it, if there's a 
kind of a mechanism, of some sort of a planning mechanism that allows for these alternative management approaches to come online and commitment through whatever instrument uh, via an aggregation protocol. Perhaps we can realize economies of scale and offset some of those upfront costs for these smaller landowners. So uh, conceptually, that's where we'd like to see things at least explored and understand the feasibility of that. Uh, obviously, there's a, a lot of devil in the details with all the various stakeholders that might be involved in any given watershed. But um, in the Northwest here, we've had we've got the benefit of already having years and years and decades and decades of trying to implement salmon recovery efforts across the landscape. And uh, some of those management plans could be amended in such a ways that those those forest management practices that both benefit salmon and carbon sequestration could come online pretty quickly. Great, thank you. Um, and then just to kind of follow up, um, in, um, in any of your projects, have you come across any kind of general um, sort of proportion of how the funding uh, or how the revenue from carbon storage compares to the revenue um, from logging? Obviously, it would depend on the specifics of the location, but has anybody come across um, a, you know, sort of a general number on that? Or is that still to be determined? At Caldwell, again, it's about, the carbon is about one quarter of the value of timber. If you look at the market over roughly the last year, Again, that's very dependent on region, how many mills you have, what competition there is, what log pricing is, what species you're cutting. Uh, the, the carbon pricing in California is pretty stable. It's always around 12 bucks a ton-ish. So, um, but yeah, it's it's not as, as valuable as just harvesting. And I think that's why you've seen such, such a hesitancy from particularly private, large private forest landowners to enter into this, that if they run on short rotations, the economics are absolutely better. If you purely look at this from a financial perspective, that if you run on 40 to 60 year rotations, you make more money. And for us, again, it is about the economics of it as well. Uh, but for us, there was never a, a one or the other. It's always been both. So um, in addition, you look at the trends and just sort of a policy making, you see a lot of these net zero or commitments coming out as well. We're committed to the integrity of our carbon sequestration market. So, you know, you, you do hear these sort of uh, discussions of greenwashing or of being in favor of the emitters. We're not that tribe. We're a direct action tribe that are looking at forestry, looking at um, our, our waters are looking at, we are salmon people. That's why we appreciate, uh, again, if you look back uh, during the fishing wars, you know, there was a lot of cooperation and coordination with our Washington brothers and sisters. So we're, we're still committed to that. Um, but the other thing is there, there was a US Senate um, climate crisis uh, report, page 135 to 137 actually mentions the federal policy of carbon sequestration and the trends that we'll have in federal policy. In California, well, the, we, um, my supervisor, Tim Hayden, the deputy executive director, served on an offset a task force. So they're looking at blue carbon. They're looking at other ways that the space is going. So we appreciate as a tribe, um, again, the, the development of the space. But I also like to hear where a tribe is developing. the. What I hear a lot of times is well, that's a proprietary sort of aspect uh, within this space. So you have tribes paying somebody else that already has that marketplace um, sort of, you know, locked down. So what we're looking at is how are tribes, again, doing the EPA modeling, doing the forest service modeling, working with a jet propulsion lab, and then monetizing that on the back end. So tribes are getting paid and provided that economic uh, benefit all the way through, as well as the regulatory administrative uh, aspect as well. So we, we, we like those types of conversation, but it is going this direction um, in reducing emissions. And we just appreciate, uh, again, that, that opportunity to be part of that. Thank you. Um, we do have a, quite a few questions coming in. So um, we'll try to get through as many as we can. So thank you for sending in your questions. Um, so what one question was about the strengths and knowledge that tribes bring to forest management. 
um, you know, things like how to thin strategically, how to plan patch cuts and selective cutting in a way that enhances the forest and yet still produces wood products. Um, and so the question was about how were tribes doing this or understanding this before the CCA was enacted and how does that enhance the work that tribes are doing? I'll take a shot at that one. So if uh, I'm the president of the Intertribal Timber Council as well. So we've got examples of this across the country if you go to any region that because of tribal cultures, they're, they're very cognizant of what natural processes are, ecosystem function are. So that typically is how they manage. I mean, the one exception is maybe how some of the Alaska Native corporations operate just a bit, but generally economics is a, is a very low priority driver in management decision-making. So that work has happened on Indian reservations and areas that tribes had control of for, I mean, decades really at this point, since kind of the transition from BIA oversight and control to tribal self-determination. So I think the, and this was a bit of a struggle we had with California and the concept of additionality, but really it, it almost acted as a penalty for tribes that had done good management for decades that they weren't, those credits shouldn't qualify because of that good work. But through a process we finally, or the California finally recognized that that should be incentivized to maintain that type of management approach, that through those long rotations, through the right species and stocking manipulation, you could have more carbon on the landscape through time and in fire prone ecosystems, maintain them through time. Because what you've seen in much of the West is just massive destructive fires that have released tons of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So how do we combat that? It's through active management. And those forests develop with very regular fire regimes started mostly by tribes. I don't know, it depends on the region, how many of those ignitions came from tribal people at pre-contact, but I mean, it's probably north of 70% in most places in the West. And those are non-existent now. So when we look at the departure of our current forest, well, landscape in general, it's largely due to the, the removal of fire and fire adapted ecosystems. So um, I think tribes are way ahead of the curve on that. They've recognized that most still maintain that in their culture. And we're trying to find ways to create flexibility to put those old management practices back on the landscape. And again, I think Washington's protocol looks like it will allow for similar things for, for tribes to really provide a blueprint for what sustainable management for long-term rotations for long-term carbon sequestration could look like. Any other thoughts on that? Great, thank you. Um, another question that we had was about um, something that was touched upon during the panel, which is about um, this idea that offsets will allow polluters to pollute elsewhere. Um, and this, you know, sort of educating people about this. Um, does anybody want to add anything to that? I could add to that one as well, because that was a that was definitely a sticking point when we presented the Cobble project to the general membership. Um, they they saw it the same way that we were giving polluters the opportunity to continue to pollute. But what they didn't understand is through through a cap and trade type program, the intent is to really penalize or incentivize a cleanup of operations that lead to better environmental outcomes. So I don't think the tribal membership understood that the the alternative was that the polluter would just pay the tax on the greenhouse gases that they emitted. So we, I think for the most part, got them comfortable with the fact that they have two options, pay the tax directly to the state or pay the tribe for its improved forest management. But that was a, it was a lengthy conversation and hard to explain to people because carbon markets were relatively new at the time. And it was difficult because folks didn't have much background. Yes, Jordan, please add. And just to, to add to that, within, within Washington's program specifically, a couple of differences I would mention from, from California's program, I think lessons learned in, in ours. Um, so one, one key difference is that Washington's program offsets are, call them within the cap, rather than California's are outside the cap. 
So and with entities overall, they'll be using they'll be using both allowances and offsets, uh, and that total number of instruments used in a year is is subtracted from the cap next year. This may not make sense, and I apologize, but um, so the the number of offsets is kind of subtracted from the cap in the next year. So that way, we ensure that the state will hit their emissions targets in every decade going forward, no matter how many offsets are used. Whereas in California's program, those emissions happen outside. There's a lot of offsets happen out, outside the cap, and so uh, the offsets may not necessarily line up with the with the emissions targets. And then another difference to mention, um, we have a provision in, in the regulation that states that um, for entities, compliance entities, so so companies that are contributing significantly to pollution and overburdened communities, ecology shall reduce those those uh, the amount of offsets they can use to ensure that uh, major emitters uh, are required to reduce their emissions on site rather than simply using offsets as a portion of their compliance. Um, so a couple differences to highlight there, but I think that there's uh, certainly this is, this is an important issue and we will continue to be uh, vigilant to ensure that offsets are not used to, to move pollution around. I just want to chime in and first of all, Jordan, thank you for that, because um, those are, are really thoughtful improvements to the overall policy construct we're looking at here. And I think that's really important to keep in mind. If, if folks were looking at carbon markets 10 years ago, 20 years ago, if you look at how registries have emerged in certain parts of the world, um, and how carbon credit projects are being established in places like the Amazon, there is there are some people out there that are, are fleecing the world in terms of saying that they're engaging in carbon offsetting, they're engaging in sequestration, but the protocols and the actual mechanisms to ensure compliance and ensure that public benefits are being delivered aren't always there. But here we are in the state of Washington in a place that has very carefully thought out how to ensure that carbon offset projects are delivering real benefits and hat off to the policymakers. From, from my perspective, as an indigenous person who you know, comes from a place where we lost everything, where the, the companies that took everything are still pumping poison into the air and polluting our air on a daily basis, I can smell the mill from down the road. Um, our trees, are cleaning that air, no matter what, every single day. We fought to protect our lands and, and carbon offsets will help us ensure that these lands, we can literally afford to hold on to and protect these lands into perpetuity because of this project. There is a definite trade-off that you have to account for here, but the bottom line from, from the communities that I've talked to that have engaged in this place, this is a commitment to being a part of something that's good for the greater good, um, that most significantly on the ground is protecting and preserving indigenous homescapes um, and, and ensuring that these lands are gonna remain indigenous in trust or not, whether you trust the United States or not that long, we're committed to these lands for the next 100 plus years. And you know, I, I, I don't care what green organization you're from that has a problem with carbon offsets, I can almost guarantee that those organizations have not experienced dispossession and violations of our rights in a way that makes compelling the idea of long-term protection through, through carbon offset projects. Wow, excellent answer. Thank you so much. Um, well, we have time for one more question. We might go a little after 10.30, so hopefully that is okay with everybody since we started a little after nine. Um, before I ask the last question, I just want to say thank you so much to all of the speakers. I uh, really appreciate you sharing your knowledge and your information. And it has just been so illuminating and very powerful to hear what all of you are doing um, as we you know, work together to um, solve climate crisis in a way that is beneficial for tribal sovereignty and for all of us. So thank you so much. Um, and so for our last question, um, we just wanted to ask kind of a general question. Um, what do you see as the most significant barrier in tribal participation in carbon offset projects? We've talked a little bit about it, but we um, would love to hear your final thoughts on this. 
to anybody who wants to just chime in. Well, for the Europe tribe, I, again, just want to sort of briefly touch on that. Number one, it's educating as well as embarking and engaging in the markets as well. So a lot of times we'll have to engage on the sort of federal history, U.S. history, state history, at the same time as educating the lawyers and attorneys and the staff and the CFOs of this is what we'd like to do. And so I think once, we're, you know, we're not making any doubts or changes to we are consciousness changing and paradigm shifting within this space and carbon offsets again um, we've been able to create those effective worker relationships one number two effective decision making within the drafting of documents regulations policies trends and number three providing as Cody and, and the other panelists mentioned providing that cultural integrity and value added of how traditional ecological knowledges, as well as business practices within these traditional communities, not only amongst ourselves, but with external interfacing as well. So for us, we're, we're getting through that, you know, educating as well as participating and engaging in the market. Once we're able to do both, I think that's gonna be not only the benefit for the Yurok tribe, as well as other tribal peoples, but also for the states and regions and, and other citizens, recognizing that benefit is also benefiting them. And I would completely agree with Javier, it's, it's education that carbon markets are fairly new, um, particularly to tribes. Although when you look at the projects, there's a lot of tribal projects, but it's, it's not something that's historically been part of tribal forest management plans or programs. So the, the protocols are fairly complicated. They change fairly regularly. So it takes a lot of work from the staff. And for some tribes, they just have a small limited staff. If you've got 10 people working in your natural resource department, something like this is probably more complex than what you can take on. At Colville as the natural resource director, I had 600 people just in my division. So we had adequate staffing to review this and ensure that it aligned with our management approach. And with a hundred year commitment, you have to be very confident about that when you make that recommendation to your tribal council. So it's a bit of a capacity issue, I think. And then the fact that it's complex, it's a long education process, not just for your staff, but for your leadership. What I'd add to, to the good responses from Javier and Cody um, kind of takes it down to a deeper level. The education is key. Um, but, but to me, when, when I've been engaging in these conversations, the reason that education is key is because there's often a distrust of something new from the outside. And, you know, especially if you're in a community that, um, lost everything, you know, you were terminated, you know, you, you lost all of your lands. These histories are all around Indian country. Here comes a new program, um, with a bunch of rules that you don't necessarily understand from people from outside their community with a great idea to preserve and protect, you know, whatever it is. There's trauma that I think from my perspective causes me, my first reaction to carbon offsets was like, no way, it's way too good to be true. And it's because we've heard that, you know, we've been sold that bill of goods and we've seen that bill of goods turn out to be snake oil, right? And so I think, you know, when you're engaging in community education, I always advocate for people, whether you're, you're, you're from within the tribal community trying to talk to your community or coming from more importantly, the outside in. So you gotta level and understand these community experiences. And when you're developing that community education, calibrate it so that it's addressing really where people are coming from. Is, it, is the fear that, you know, this is too long, future generations can't manage this. Will somebody come in and take our lands if we don't manage this the right way? I've heard that many, many times from tribal communities considering that. And that comes from historical trauma. And so I think just acknowledging that, recognizing that can make for a more holistic community education process and, and maybe yield more positive outcomes. But I think just acknowledging that um, will, will make for um, a more constructive dialogue in the communities that are considering these projects. Any other thoughts before we wrap up? Well, once again, thank you to all of our speakers for sharing your time and your knowledge and your perspectives with us. It really has been quite precious. 
Um, thank you also to all of our attendees for attending this session. Um, a quick reminder that uh, the next session will start at 11 and the topic will be extended rotations, how a new model helps us understand potential carbon and harvest volume benefits. I will see you there and look forward to the next chapter in the Tribal Carbon Offset Project story. Thank you, everyone.